Welcome, class. <laughs> Before I start, a big disclaimer for all of you, but this is all my own opinion. So, like, obviously, to each person, it is different how this is done. This is, like, all my own opinion in terms of, like, content creation and, like, VTubing and stuff like that. Like, all the tips and advice is from what I feel. A lot of these, like, things I talk about can also apply to general streaming. You don't have to be a VTuber. It, you could just be, like, a flesh tuber or, like, just a PNG tuber or whatever. It all, like, it's just... Just general advice on, like, algorithm and stuff like that. So, the first slide. The biggest factor uh, regarding how to make it as a content creator is luck and networking. And, like, I'm not going to deny that luck pays a huge factor. If you watch any, like, video I got regarding, like, how do I become a content creator? How do I be a big famous streamer? Everybody will tell you that luck is one of the biggest factors when it comes to streaming it's your biggest your big break basically um but even when you have your big break you must be able to utilize it to keep the momentum there's so many times when someone will have their big break and then they do nothing with it they just coast they'll just keep on streaming as if it's normal the thing is, when you get your biggest break ever, you have to, like, keep up the momentum. And a lot of eyes are on you at that point. You can't just take a break right after you get your, like, biggest opportunity. Because sometimes when they get their big break, they'll be like, uh, I'm not gonna stream after, like, two or three days. Your momentum's gone. You gotta milk it. <laughs> It seems so simple, but it's something that a lot of people don't realize. You know, you're like, oh, you have to take a break. You have to rest. But when you have the biggest opportunity of your life, you can't rest until you're stable. Because when you lose this, when will you get it again? You have to go in thinking that you only have one huge opportunity. Negative side to this is that some streamers don't know when they are in a safe position. And that's why a lot of streamers and a lot of content creators don't know when to take a break. And that's why you see a lot of burnout. There's lots of things like this to worry about. You have to know when you can relax and when you can take a break. And I feel like when you have your biggest opportunities, I personally think like you keep going until you can start to see that your growth has stabilized. That you think is going to be your average for a while. And that even if you take a break, maybe like one or two weeks break. I know like some people are like a month break or something. If you're in a company, you might be able to take a longer break. If you're an indie, one to two weeks is the optimal spot for a break because you're not gone long enough that it will affect your algorithm. And you're not gone long enough that people have watched other streamers. One to two weeks is like the safe zone. Anything more than that, it's a little bit of a gamble. If you're on Twitch, you don't have to worry about algorithm that much. But, like, if you're on YouTube, algorithm is, like, very, very important. Because it affects how much your content is being pushed outside of the regular sphere. Why is it not to be worried on Twitch? It's because the Twitch algorithm is mostly just, you know, the front page. Streamers you want to watch, you might recommend and stuff like that. But Twitch growth is mostly relied on raids. Raids and VTuber collabs or collaborations in general really help Twitch growth. While on YouTube, YouTube growth really benefits on the algorithm and what you upload and what you're streaming. The moment you're coasting on YouTube, the less YouTube will push you out to other new viewers. Another thing I want to talk about is networking. Your growth heavily relies on networking and who you reach out to and who you're working with who you're socializing with it relies heavily on your social skills and how open you are to reaching out to people you don't have to be friends with everybody it can be just like a cash relationship between business partners and stuff like that it doesn't have to be a friendship it can be a colleague just someone like mutual collab partners um especially if you're like an introvert like me i meet people but i don't have to force friendships on people because it has to be mutual like you feel like you groove with somebody also like stream personalities 
is not the same as off stream personalities. How I portray myself on stream, I'm like super energetic, I'm like chaotic on stream. It's very easy for me to be like that because I very much enjoy streaming, but like off stream, I am very chill. <laughs> So my off stream is like very different because most of my energy and most of my battery is on stream. Maybe you like groove with somebody's on stream personality. The on stream chemistry is really, really good. But me off stream, you're just casual acquaintances. So like I said, you don't have to be friends with everybody, but it's really good to like know people at least. For example, like Twitch Rivals. When I first got invited to Twitch Rivals, I talked with one of the head people who organized is Twitch Rivals. And I told him like, oh, I really enjoy Twitch Rivals. It was really, really fun. Is it possibly invited in future Twitch Rivals? Because I really enjoyed doing them. I could have just like done Twitch Rivals and not cared about it after that. But instead, I personally reached out to the head of the Twitch Rivals organizer and told them how much I enjoy doing them, how much my fans enjoy me doing them, and how I would love to participate more in the future. And that is how I got my connections with Twitch. And that's really it. That's how I basically got like invites consistently to like these events. If you ask directly, the worst he can say is no <laughs> or ghost you. You took your shot and that's all that matters. You have to get onto these opportunities, be able to interact with people and openly ask about like whether or not it's possible to do these things. If they ghost you, then you're like, fine, you move on. You have to be able to accept rejection and getting ghosted because that is the way of being a streamer and content creator. It's gonna fucking hurt, but you have to accept it. Like. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that is one of the biggest factors on like making it as a content creator. But yes, like I said, luck is why a lot of people want to join a company. And it already comes with an established audience. And after that, even when you make it to the company, it's your job to keep those eyes on you and continue building it. Because it's not like you can coast after that or you're just gonna stagnate so which is why my next slide will be going over indie versus company i'll be going over company first and a lot of this is sort of like public knowledge i'm not like going to be going to any details that could break nda and stuff like that pros and cons obviously i'll be going over like why would she join a company and also like things to be aware of and like i said you get an instant audience base so the audience of the company and of the VTubers that debut before you will be there for your debut because you might not be the first person there. There is already the branding involved. So you're going in with an established audience. That's why a lot of people want to join. It draws a lot of attention and it's your job to make a good debut so you can keep the attention of those people that watched you. They don't know anything about you, but they're all here to be there to watch you. You could be a hidden gem out there as an indie before you sign up for a company. And it's up to the company to reveal why you're a hidden gem. There's so many really good indies out there that never had their big break, but it's only because of joining a company, they receive their big break. Another reason why is because you get a group of people to collaborate with instantly. One, this is one of the things I've learned as an indie, how it's very difficult as an indie to find a group of people or a collab group that you collabs with and be able to organize something really easily. And a company, you can literally just ask anybody, like there might be a server or something and you can just be like, at everyone, I wanna play this game. I need three people. That is one of the reasons why people wanna join. They want a sense of community and they want a group of people to be able to play games with or like to be able to organize stuff with. So it gives like a security and you don't have to contact people outside your circle to fill in spots or work on socializing. And the another reason is if you're a singer or a dancer, a lot of the biggest events that VTuber companies do are concerts. If you're talented at singing, you will get picked to do concerts. Since you're under a group, you can do big group concerts with lots of other singers. And it's much easier to set up versus as an individual and all the costs are within from the company and also like they have access to music labels um it depends on which company you're joining if you want to be like more well known as a singer it's easier to do that when you're joining a company as well as like not only that 
but cover songs, group songs, karaoke's, these are like some of the easiest ways to help boost not only your channel, but the company's branding as well. I think it's one of the reasons why I felt like I'd be slacking off or like not worth much. Because as a person who can't sing, you have to think, what can I offer to the company that can be used for events and big productions? Uh, for me, I would say like gaming. But I can't really do that. <laughs> I can't have like host like a big event. Uh, I feel like personally, it might be harder to do versus like singing. Oh, but Doki, what about like tournaments and stuff like that? I have moments in the past where I was invited to do things like physical meet and greets for like gaming stuff. Uh, I had to actually be there to play the game. And I had to say no, because as a VTuber, that is very dangerous. <laughs> Also, another thing is if the main branch is not English speaking, but you speak the language. One of the reasons why I put this here is that if you want to apply for a company whose main branch is in English speaking, I strongly suggest learning that language while you're applying or if you make it in. Because speaking that language offers so many opportunities, including being able to collaborate with talents and participate in main branch events. Another thing is that the main consumer base will also be in the main branch. If you speak the language, you might have more fans in the main target demographic, thus offering you more opportunities to receive sponsors dedicated to the main demographic. It seems like super simple, but like it's something you have to be incredibly committed to do. It just helps you in the long run. You can reach out to different fan bases. Obviously, the English fan base might be different from other uh, language speaking fan bases. But if you are like trying to cater to both fan bases, you need to be able to balance this because you have to make sure like one audience doesn't feel left out over the other. So you have to be able to balance this very well as well. My suggestions on these is just maybe have like one stream a week dedicated to speaking that language. Another thing is you don't need to worry about like big picture and legal stuff. What I meant by that is that when you're in a company, all of this is handled by the management. What I've noticed is that as an indie, when you get merch collaborations, like offers and deals, there's like contracts and negotiations that you have to be involved in. And because of that, you also have to obviously read those contracts of the merch negotiations. But when you're in a company, you don't really have to worry that much about the big picture stuff because obviously the company will make sure it wouldn't like hurt them regarding like sponsors and merch stuff. But as an indie, even your manager is reading that. You have to read it yourself as well because what the manager is doing doesn't necessarily mean that that is what you want. So you have to be able to read your contracts and negotiate for things you want. That is also obviously like a lot of work. <laughs> Anyway, another one obviously is 3D. Companies are very well experienced with doing 3Ds. And I would say companies in Japan have the most experience with doing VTuber 3D. And I feel like in NA, a lot of companies in NA are still playing catch up when it comes to what JP companies have done. Not just JP companies, but JP Indies too. Indies in Japan also have like really good 3Ds because a lot of studios in Japan are very well versed in doing anime 3Ds. 3D in general, is a lot of work so that's like one thing that can offer as an indie you might not be able to have that opportunity because getting a studio that's able to handle all of that having the assets made as well like japanese companies and japanese 3d tech is that a lot of them have already have assets made from the past that you can use it's a lot of money invested and they've already invested so much money that's why it is much more difficult as an indie and this if you're really looking forward to doing 3d and stuff there's a reason why you want to join a company and finally sponsors it's easier if you don't have to reach out for sponsors now things to be aware of number one permissions you need permission for things music games and others what do you mean by others graphics pictures images videos everything maybe this is your favorite game of all time you really want to stream it but you can't and you have to be able to accept that <laughs> someone says is this only for japanese companies 
no a lot of smaller companies in na have to deal with that too and maybe like you're not allowed to do certain things or say certain things because like you represent the company and you have to be aware of what you say and how you act so you have to be aware that your stance and actions reflect the company's values and if you join a company you have to be very neutral in a lot of things you have to be sure of like when you say things of like i like this thing that it's safe to say <laughs> <laughs> and even then, if you are an indie that's planning to join a company, you have to make sure you're like, I guess, like brand friendly because like what you see on the internet is forever. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's like, oh, that was before. What you say on the internet is forever. So you have to be sure your internet history is OK. <laughs> Another thing is juggling your schedule regarding overlaps if you're in a company you want to be like respectful to other people's schedules so maybe like oh this person's gonna have a sponsor stream at that time i don't want to overlap it i'm gonna make sure to upgrade into the sponsor stream because how well they do in sponsors might mean the sponsor would want to do more with us you can't just focus on yourself you have to be sure that you're helping everybody if everybody grows that's a good thing you're a team player and obviously percentage cuts taken I think that's like very self-explanatory. So because they're like funding some things, they're helping you in some stuff, they are arranging things for you and stuff like that. So it's obvious. So now, okay, what about an indie? So as an indie, basically it's like opposite of a lot of stuff I said regarding company. So as an indie, there's more freedom what you can do. You have all the creative control on everything you do and how you want your channel to be. And you get to keep 100% what you make because you're by yourself and your networking and connections stays with you. Everything, your connections and all of that directly goes to you. And then you get to create the merchandise you want to make and guide the production. Like I said, like the thing about being indie is just everything is up to you. How you want to make your career, everything. But of course, with more freedom comes more risk. So... Because of that, you're opening yourself up legally to more risk that you might not be prepared of. Obviously, like scams, stuff like that. Depending on how big you are, you will eventually have to have a business lawyer that can help you look over contracts. You don't want to be taking advantage when it comes to like sponsors. You also have to work harder when it comes to networking and branding because it all comes down to you. Variety is an easier route versus niche streaming. Because niche streaming, when you're doing niche streaming, you're restricted to that certain niche. You can't really branch out because the moment you branch out, your viewership will not follow you it doesn't matter if you're like no they love me your viewership most likely will just find another streamer that might be streaming that particular niche so like like someone said if you only stream that one thing those viewers will only show up for that one thing when that niche dies you are in trouble variety is better for you long term even though it's harder to get started okay auditioning obviously i won't be giving out audition secrets um, but like I've talked about this before obviously like the first stage would be like submitting a video audition And then when I realized my video audition passed I made a 10 page document preparing myself to the next round I like worked very hard on that all in there was like research and stuff like that There's lots of resources out there from members within companies that reveal very crucial audition advice and insight onto the interviews and the audition tapes. I personally looked at Twitter and YouTube in different languages to find audition interview questions. When you're doing your application, you have to find your niche and main character type that you want to play because they're trying to find a character for you. They're trying to figure out what will you bring? Will you be a new personality or will you be a personality that is similar to like one of their popular talents? And if you're really, really, really want to be in a uh, no matter what company, don't be afraid of applying over and over and over and over again until you make it in. Keep going as an indie and keep submitting Um, equipment. All right. Number one. Audio. Audio is so fucking important. <laughs> I will not watch a stream if I hear shitty audio quality. If the first thing you're gonna invest, please invest in a microphone. A good quality mic. And what are mixers? Mixers make sure you don't fucking peek when you're talking. So when you're laughing, when you're screaming, stuff like that. Mixers is a way to make sure your audio doesn't 
peak. It's nice. Um, when you're whispering, it's not fucking terrible. <laughs> you can mute audio so that people can't hear, but you can hear, stuff like that. You can use OBS audio filters, but it's not as good as a mixer. Anyways, the reason why audio balancing is so important is that when you are in a collab, there are some viewers that will only watch the streamer that has the best audio balance. They're like, oh, hey, I want to hear everybody. You know, I want to hear everybody. I want to know what everybody's saying. So, you know, you can ask a friend to be like, hey, can you check my stream? If you don't, if you don't, you don't have like a person really to like really check on your audio. You can ask a friend like don't ask chat. <laughs> You'd be like, hey, chat, how's the audio? Never fully trust chat because chat is not a hype mind and it really depends on the headphones on whether or not like the audio is good. Some people say yes, some people say no. And then you don't know who to listen to. Find one person you trust very much to monitor your audio. And then just monitor your audio for the first like one minute to make sure everything is good. This is like my timeline of everything. If you are a singer, if you want to get started into singing, these are not singing microphones. <laughs> if you're serious, get a actual singing mic and like research on that. I can't give you the research for that because I don't know. <laughs> Everything else, in my opinion, is just a bonus until you actually make money. <laughs> All right. Twitch versus YouTube. Should you stream on Twitch? Should you do YouTube? Or should you multi-stream? I am primarily on YouTube. It's because I'm used to it. I also... I like having set schedules because it helps me plan my day and time. I don't like streaming whatever I want because I'm super fucking indecisive. <laughs> I like knowing what I'm doing. For Twitch, the biggest benefits of Twitch is the rating system, which benefits you because if you're starting out, raids help so much with growing your presence and channel. It benefits companies more than it benefits individuals for YouTube. But on Twitch, it benefits, you know, everybody, like individuals. Because, like, there's not a lot of VTubers on YouTube as an indie. And it's harder for discoverability on YouTube versus Twitch. The thing about Twitch is that there is, like, an option to look for lower viewed streamers on Twitch to find raids. Like, there are moments when, like, you know, bigger content creators on Twitch will go to a category. The thing about YouTube, you can't go to a category, find people you want to raid. The reason why Nicewig blew up was because Dizzy was browsing through apex twitch streamers and found nicewig on twitch streaming in the apex category dizzy at the time was like the biggest apex streamer and he raided nicewig and nicewig took that big luck opportunity and rode it to where he is now that is why when you're starting out easiest way to hit your biggest break is on twitch Maybe later on you can move to YouTube. But I think if you're starting out, this is NA, by the way. I don't know for other countries, but if you're starting out, I would say Twitch is your biggest bet. On YouTube, it is a lot harder for an indie. For English speaking audiences, if you're a streamer, you're on Twitch. I was just lucky to be able to do YouTube because I already have an audience established on YouTube. It's better to start on twitch and then move on to youtube because i think long term youtube is better because you have everything in one channel you have the vods you have videos you have shorts twitch is just streaming usually people don't watch vods on twitch people will watch edited content on youtube of your twitch vods have your vods edited into highlights don't just upload VODs. People would rather watch edit highlights than a fucking two to three hour video. Uh, <laughs> if you upload your VODs, have a separate VOD channel. The reason why I don't upload my VODs, my Twitch VODs, onto my YouTube channel, my main one, is that that affects my algorithm so much. And because of that, I have a separate VOD channel. All right, but what about multi-stream? Yes, you can multi-stream. It's a very popular method right now, uh, especially in NA. I don't think like other countries, people are doing multi-streams. I personally don't do multi-streams because I don't like splitting the audience. Twitch culture is different from YouTube culture. And then if you choose, if you multi-stream, you only have one chat up. So I'd rather pay attention to one singular chat and just juggle. I make one my main 
and the other different. If you're a small streamer, you can do both because it's very good for growth. I don't do both because like I want to focus on nurturing one community versus like trying to split myself too much. Also, there is like different cultures like viewer culture and streaming cultures. YouTube VTuber viewers, they like schedules. They like thumbnails and they like it when you plan stuff. But also, you have to realize that because you have a schedule, viewers will pick and choose what they want to watch. So, you know, sometimes you stream something, they know you're going to stream this, but it's not something they want to watch, so they don't show up. You have more of an inconsistent concurrent viewers. <laughs> well, on Twitch, viewers are like, they don't care. <laughs> No, they do care. They do care. But like a lot of times when you're watching, you're on Twitch. They just go like, "I'm today. I want to play this, and then I gotta swap to that, and now I'm gonna do this, and now I'll do that." There's no, there's no like actual like you don't know what's gonna happen type deal. But you're always there. You're just there. You're there for them type deal. You don't care what they're doing. You just want to be there. And then there's like memberships and stuff like that. Like in Twitch. The thing is, a lot of Twitch streamers, they have Discord servers for like, which is like the substitute of the membership stuff on YouTube. YouTube offers memberships. On Twitch, there's like subs, but you're not required to have sub only streams. In YouTube, you are because like it is a benefit to be a YouTube member. You, there's more exclusivity being a member. There's a different culture on Twitch. Subs don't have like exclusivity on there. There's no exclusive stuff. Make sure to have something there to make it worth being a member. As a Twitch sub, you don't really have other than emotes. The Twitch sub, the appeal is the emotes. You know, YouTube emotes, you can only use it in one channel. But Twitch emotes, you can use it everywhere. That's the appeal. Highly recommend if you're going to be a Twitch streamer to have good emotes. All right, the algorithm. Woo! I love the algorithm. Shorts, if you're on YouTube, milk the shit out of shorts. Shorts are being heavily pushed by YouTube for a while now. I thought they would stop, but they're still doing it because they want to take over TikTok. Even streams, by the way. You might be seeing a lot of, like live streams in the shorts category because like when you're browsing through YouTube shorts, you can get like live streams now too from like random people. Everyone just wants to watch on their phone now because I don't know. <laughs> we just have very short attention spans these days. You can upload your shorts to TikTok and Instagram. Apparently, Instagram reels are also blowing up now too. But like, if you want to cater to the normies more, like... <laughs> just remember to stream! Because you need to keep your audience. You stream, upload short. What I used to do is that I would upload a short every time I'm not streaming. Because like, the YouTube algorithm is so fucked up that if you don't upload a thing for a day, They'll be like, mm, you're not uploading now? Mm. <laughs> when you have the algorithm boost, you have to be consistent regarding keeping this algorithm. I hired clippers. I don't normally pick like random editors. I clip somebody that watches me because they know what's a good content that I bring. Oh, but what if I'm making my own clips? Look at your chat and see which part has the biggest fan response because usually because there's like a there's like an analytic thing where you can see that so like when you see an analytic which one has the most like chat engagement that's usually where the best content is to clip a lot of chatters started talking so much in that one moment that must have been a good part and then you watch it back and like oh that is a good part i'm gonna edit this myself there's different types of edits you can do right now since i am an indie i'm much more free to experiment with my editing Back then, it was just mostly clips and like animated clips. Now, I'm more so experimenting with how my shorts are done. Uh, I, story time is very popular, I would say. For VTubers, if you really want to blow up with shorts, story time is the best way to go. Story time and anything to do with relatability. To blow up into like the normie sphere. Like it goes beyond just VTubing. If you look at my shorts, my most popular shorts is the is the one where about the sticker and the waking up stuff like i'll be like oh i sleep, i wake up i eat breakfast i sleep and people be like oh my god she sleeps so much she's so depressed it's so relatable <laughs> i saw that i was like what the fuck anyway fomo 
games you don't want to miss out lots of viewers don't want to miss out so they love seeing the reactions of like the vtuber streaming this particular section that's why horror games is so popular but you can't always do horror games because if you're always streaming horror games then like people get tired unless that's your niche but even if that is your niche you still have to be able to balance it out um and also comments and likes commenting and liking is so beneficial it actually helps boost the algorithm if you want to help an indie or like a small streamer comment and like their videos also like i said follow the trends i would follow like some trends if it seems fun but i if it's like too much i don't also spotify you can make so much money on Spotify. If you're starting a fan base as a singer, you start uploading things on Spotify. You can actually make a lot of money from Spotify if you have like enough songs or like enough exposure. But you have to remember, it's better if you make original songs versus like cover songs to upload on Spotify because obviously a lot of artists might not let you upload cover songs on Spotify. Like you gotta have permission from the artist to be able to upload those songs. All right, branding. If you are an animal VTuber, is the easiest when it comes to branding. Animal VTubers are like more recognizable than a human. More famous VTubers have like some animal characteristic about them. Um, if you already have a noticeable brand, I would suggest highly to keep the same brand. People really hate change. And it also helps for the normie sphere. Like average viewers outside of your community. That's like what's worrying. Because it's like when you see them, you're like, who is that? You're like, oh, it's that person. But they used to be this other person. Why do they look different now? I mean, if you swap outfits, that's fine. You see that thing and you're like, oh, I recognize them. It's this person. But I meant like a full revamp. Okay. Management and organization. All right. Don't just hire anybody to be a manager. It's so fucking stressful if you have the bad manager. Do not hire close friends. Never mix business and relationships together. It's never good. <laughs> just don't do that. Hire somebody. Look into someone with actual business experience. This is when you're getting bigger as an indie. Obviously, when you start out, you don't have managers. You do this all yourself. If you're starting out, be sure to know how to read contracts. Don't let people walk over you when you're negotiating. Like, if don't get, like, scammed into, like, signing a very predatory contract when it comes to, like, sponsors and deals. Because there's a lot of them out there. If you want to be more serious, get a business lawyer to look through the contract to make sure everything is okay. Have a business email and put it on your Twitter bio and stream streamer platform. Don't think it's just gonna walk to you. Have a business email out there. Very direct. It's there. And also, make sure the business email is like a little bit professional. <laughs> but also like... If you want to like approach sponsors and brand deals, have your own like portfolio and pitch deck made. So like when you send it to them, like they can just see your analytics and everything. So like just make sure you have those together. Also, please don't rely on Twitter DMs or Discord DMs. Make a Discord server if you're doing a project. It's so confusing when you have so many DMs everywhere. Of, so you can keep track of everything. I will show you an example of my Discord servers. Um, bam! Here you go. This is how my Discord server goes. On the left is my me and my management team. On the right is my editing team and animators. I also have animators too. So this is how I organize my Discord server. This is how the Discord server is done. So you see like here are all the important things that I have. And then on the right, you can see like, oh, hey, for editing, here are the rules. Here's my editing rules, what I want the clips to have. The general stuff where people want to talk in general. Assets that I give them regarding like PNGs, stuff like that. Timestamp claims so the editors won't fucking like overlap each other with timestamps. Like if they're clipping something. Clip downloads so like when they're finished with a clip, they just plop the links there. They just plop the links there for me to download. And then if they have any editing thing they need to ask, they just put it there. And then I have private channels with each individual editor. 
So if they weren't asking anything privately, they talk to me in the private chat. Everything is organized in a way so that like it's just automated type deal. It's just very organized and like I know where things are. <laughs> I don't want repeats. So like the animator and the editor teams have to be sure they don't animate or clip the same thing. And that's why I combine them together. All right, general tips I've tried to follow. These are my own way of streaming. First off, I saw like people were saying, how do you deal with losing a topic of like uh, dead air? I actually keep a list of topics I want to talk about on stream. Every time I think of something I want to talk about, if I have dead air, I have a uh, channel where I type random topics throughout the day. And then I would just pull that up if I have to. I don't use it all the time. So if I think I have dead air, if I don't know what I'm going to talk about, I would just pull it up and be like, oh, yeah. I'd be like, oh, my God, guys, I just remembered. Did you guys know? Blah, 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 blah. I do it like once every two to three weeks because I'm so used to streaming now. This was like back then when I was first starting out and I was not very good at tangents. I don't know what to talk about. I would make sure I write stuff down. I would write bullet points. So I would write bear hibernation, stuff like that, just to make sure I remember. But it's basically for people who are just starting out and like are not very good at talking. If you are a variety streamer, this is what I do. This is my own personal opinion. I tend to keep long playthroughs, three to four streams max, because the longer the series, the less viewership it's gonna get, which is because our attention is really fucked now. Uh, <laughs> this is for your YouTuber. If you're a Twitch streamer, it's different. If you wanna work with artists that are not English speaking, get a translator. I've had this experience before. I wanted to work with an artist that didn't speak English, and I wrote in English. I also wrote like my, my translation as well. But then they were like, oh, sorry, we don't want to. We only work with people who speak it native, like fluently. Because they didn't want to deal with like issues. If you didn't like the art and then like they don't understand what you want changed and stuff. There's like translation issues and stuff like that. But I would highly suggest getting an actual translator or or use DeepL. But let the artist know that you're using a translation software. Because you don't want to like, you know, lie and be like, I'm actually fluent, but you're using a translation. Um, have a consistent time block. That is why I have two set time blocks. 12.30 p.m. PST and 5 p.m. PST. That is my time block. And that's what people know. People know that you stream around those time. Consistency is key. Always have a dedicated time block. Don't stream random hours all the time. Your audience will not know what to do. Have mods. <laughs> don't self-moderate. And have them be, like, mostly silent. But, like, not too silent. Like, it's like, if they want to interject, they can. But, like, the thing is, we don't want a mod to spam the chat. My mods, they all have second accounts. Their mod account is actually their second account. So they have two accounts. One for moderating and one to chat. Just like a regular dragoon. I have them mostly silent because I don't want to cause any issues. And that is why they're mostly silent. Also, please make a business PayPal and set up a business account. If you want to make this a long-term career, it would be so good for you. Please remember to set everything up as a business. All right, merch. Very important as an indie. I would say merch. I did not realize how much merch matters until recently. A lot of income can come from merch. If you want to do your own merch... If you want to handle the whole merch yourself and not want to look at distributors, Alibaba is your friend. It is a good manufacturer website. And when you're researching manufacturers yourself, you have to look at like samples and like, okay, and you have to like get like samples made and all that stuff too. You have to look at samples and like make sure you're not getting scammed. Of course, you're not getting scammed. And the quality is what you want. Obviously, the more you pay, for a manufacturer, the more expensive things are gonna get to be made. And the more expensive things are gonna get to be sold. But the quality is a lot better. You have to be able to pick and choose. You have to be able to, like, make sure that is what you want to work with. Anyway, making your own merch. So, there's a lot of things you can do to make your own merch. Yay! <laughs> Button makers, they are 150 to 300 US dollars. 
including the materials. It's just a button press. You commission an artist to make a button design, and then you print it out. That's it. And then you fucking boom, 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 bam, done. And that's how you make a button. You can sell them for like two to four dollars, depending on how big the button is. Printing your own stickers! Sticker paper! That's a thing! Sticker papers are a thing! Or there's like local printing shops that make stickers. And then printing your own poster cards and prints at a local store. That works. You don't have to worry. Anyway, if you're gonna work with distributors, obviously they're gonna take a cut of your money because you're working with them. They're gonna be like doing the whole thing for you. Like the researching manufacturers and uh, making sure like the quality and stuff like that. But you gotta research and read the contract very thoroughly. I do it myself because I want to keep majority of the earnings. Because I know how to do it and I have experience doing it. And that is why I handle everything myself regarding merch. Alright, networking and collabs! Balance your schedule! I talked about this before. But please, do not make it mostly collabs. Collab streams should not be more than solo streams. Because if you spend too many collabs per week, especially when you're just starting out, then you're not building a fan base. I do one to two collabs per week. Because if I have lots of collabs going on, I also try to balance it more with solo streams. Because I know my dragoons, they also want some personal dragoon time. They want me to interact with the chat. Uh, and that's why, like, you, they want to have an identity. You don't want to be the collabber. <laughs> you want to have personal content so people will know your personality. So like I said, don't rely too much on collabs. If you're on YouTube, it, like, gives more opportunities for, like, dead subs and followers and stuff. And you don't want that. You don't want people to just follow you because you collab with this one person. You want them to follow you because they enjoyed that experience. And they want to watch more of you. This is why a lot of, like, collab channels die so fast. Okay, you can look at this example with flesh tubers. A lot of flesh tubers, they, like, become big because of the group they are with. But as soon as that YouTube group falls apart, their channel dies. Because the viewers, they only want to watch that channel for the group they are in. Not because of the people they are. They're like, oh, my friend group experience. No. Like, that's the thing. Especially, like, when they started going their separate ways... They didn't have a, really an identity beyond that. They didn't have the identity. Like, it, you can't be just the friend group. You have to be your own individual. All right. How to be good at collabs. But there's two roles in a collab. This is how I see it. The support and the leader. You look at it as a comedy duo. But it can be like a group thing too. So you can have the straight man and the leader. Or like the... The... The dumb one. <laughs> <laughs> or the chaotic one or the one with the comedy you need someone to react someone to bring the reaction or you can be both one of the strongest skills you can have is to be both of them and i think i personally i can be both if i'm in a group that's way too chaotic i can be the reactor like the one that tries to be like the sane one in the group so you don't want a whole group filled with supporters. Like, you know, all the people who can only do support. You don't want a full group of chaotic people. Because it will be way too much. You need to be able to have a healthy balance. I've also done random people. Like, being who's free. Like, I've done both. It really depends on, like, how you want to see the collab. Uh, so that is, like, my, my, like, ideology when it comes to setting up these collabs. Socialize! I hate it, but... <laughs> Always remember the people who were there for you. So, return favors and offer opportunities back to other people. It's always good for you long run. And the worst people can say is no. Like I said, always shoot your shot. The worst is they ghost you or they say no. You have to get used to rejection. It's happened a lot. Sometimes people ghost you not because they didn't want to work with you. It's because they're so fucking busy. Just be aware that these things happen on a lot of content creators. Like, have their own lives. And, like, maybe they don't want to collab. And then they just don't want to say no. What else? Oh, yeah. Websites and resources. All right. So, here are some really good websites and resources for you to use for streaming. There's Booth. There's Nizima. The four things I listed, they're really good resource websites. They're really good for assets and backgrounds and, like, VTuber models or skin suits. A lot of there is for free. Care fun.
fun. It's really good for karaoke's or singing. Like you don't you're worried about like copyright claims and stuff like that. I highly suggest using Carefun. Usually, if you use Carefun stuff, you don't have to worry about copyright things. It's a subscription fee though. It's like fifty dollars, I think, a month. If you're like a regular singer or like you or you like to do karaoke's, this is a good investment. And then shoes, um, you have to Patreon pledge stuff. And, but they're really good for like settings and stuff where like the light at the background actually looks like it connects with the with the VTuber. It's just really good atmospheric stuff to use when you're streaming. Okay, mental health care. If you want to be a content creator, you have to know you're so fucked when it comes to mental. <laughs> There's no one that's okay. <laughs> It doesn't have to be like really bad, but you will you will feel you will feel it. <laughs> if you want to be a content creator or like anything to do with making content on the internet, you will not have like the most positive mental health experience. It's all about mitigating it. <laughs> like just make sure you have a support system. That is outside of content creation. So you'll need like an outside perspective. You really need very thick skin to be able to like do this as a career. Numbers will affect you because you don't want to fucking fail. Like, you know, you of course you'll be like, I'm trying to have better numbers because I want to have a successful career. So you have to be aware. And that is like the biggest risk you have to take. Just have to remember that. All right, anyway, do you have a workout routine or do you sustain through pure mental fortitude and caffeine? Right now, I haven't really had a really decent workout routine at the moment um, because I'm not stabilized at the moment. Before, in the past, I did. I have a treadmill in my room. I don't normally drink caffeine, but I have drank caffeine at least like once or twice a week. And because I really need it, <laughs> like, I, there's been a lot of stuff. I only drink caffeine off stream. I don't do it on stream. I know a lot of people think I'm like super energetic. I just drink water when I'm streaming. How do you find game? What games are popular? Are there any tools do you use for this? Very easy. You go on Steam. You go to recently released or upcoming games. You just like look at Steam reviews. If a game on Steam recently released has more than like 500 plus reviews, then most likely it is going to be like a meta game. It's going to be a meta stream. Another way is you go at Twitch and see like what's popular. You go to browse and then categories. If you see a stream of a game that's like, oh, I've never seen this before. I've never seen this game before. What the fuck? And then you click on it and you're like, Oh, that's a new stream meta. The Twitch front page is basically a story of like, what's meta? You can also follow some big content creators. These content creators, they always follow meta. What's the best way to announce a big project or event so that you can receive the most engagement? On stream, live. You don't say anything about what the thing is. You say special announcement, special event, and then you reveal it on stream. And you reveal the participants on stream. You don't reveal it on twitter or like social media first you reveal it on stream because people want to know who's participating so you announce it on stream one by one it builds up anticipation you're like oh who's gonna be next whoa so you announce things live not via um social media unless it's like a tournament invite then like you can't really announce that live <laughs> Yeah, it's like you see like everybody always does this. Oh, I'm doing this thing. Wait until the very end. Oh, if you want to hear what the announcement is, you wait until the very end because you make all the viewers wait until the very end. If it's a regular stream with announced tact on the end, it, make, it makes the viewers stay until the very end because they want to know what the announcement is. Hearing everything you have to say made me realize that I'm better off pursuing content creation as a hobby rather than a job. The thing is, a lot of content creators start off as a hobby. Because it's not stable. It's not a stable job and it's all about luck. It's best if you start out as like an extra income and not like, you know, go full in. Because like, you always need to have a backup plan. A lot of people start off content creation as a hobby. And then later on, when it gets more successful, full, like you start investing more into it. And then when you make enough money, you can like, you know, fully commit to it. And that's like the safest way. How to smoothly approach other streamers to make genuine connections. Twitter and their chat. 
I made friends by raiding other Twitch streamers and also like talking to them on Twitter and interacting with them. Like they tweet something, I would like boost booster tweets and stuff by retweeting it and like you know talk to them on Discord and talk to them on Twitch and like like play games with them off stream. Like it's all about being consistent and stuff like that. Obviously, I am a lot more busy now, so I don't have time to really like do that anymore. Back then, back then I would just, you know, just hang out and talk to them and just raid raid their streams and because I wanted to like know them more. How do you come up with good jokes on the spot and chat entertain? For chat entertainment, don't bash something over and over again. Don't beat up a dead horse. That's really it. Like, chat entertainment, as long as you don't beat a dead horse and, like, keep bringing up something over and over and over again repetitively, that's, like, the best advice I can give you. Like, there are moments where, like, some jokes would come up that I would say that became, like, memes and, like, like phrases that were, like, my chat would consistently bring up, but I wouldn't say it that often. Um, because you don't overkill it. <laughs> As long as the chat is entertaining themselves, that's all that matters. And regarding like, how do I come up with these jokes on the spot? When I first started streaming, I got peer pressure to stream. I didn't stream because I wanted to be a streamer. This is a little lore. I was using voice chat to like play Overwatch and I had a streamer in my game. And then um, later on, I became friends with some streamers who played Overwatch. They was all high-ranked Overwatch. And then, like, they told me to start streaming. And so, they were like, Oh, we think you're very entertaining. You should... Because I would say, like, random shit. Like... <laughs> um, because of that, like, they were like, You should start streaming. And then I did. I started streaming because of that. Um, and that's why I, I honestly can't give advice on, like, how to do jokes and how to be entertaining. Because, like, I said, like... But I never committed to it. I never, like tried i just did it for fun also if you're a content creator get twitter blue you have to <laughs> editing your post and being able to tweet really long tweets is really good it's just it sucks that that is a bot service i hope that what i gave you guys was enough to help you in some way and i hope you guys learn a lot about content creation yippee